next up, we have a three-person panel titled Empowering the Tango 2 Community, Strength in Support. The first panelist is Amanda Hull from Suffolk in England. She and her husband Daniel have three boys, Joe, Sebi, and Walter. Sebi is a 13-year-old diagnosed with Tango 2 deficiency disorder, and Amanda has worked as an educational psychologist for the past 18 years. So please help me, help me in welcoming our first panelist, Amanda Hull. Morning. Uh, so I've written down my name's Amanda, and uh, I have three boys, uh, Sebi, Joe, and Walter, and Sebi has uh, Tango 2 disorder. Um, so I am an educational psychologist by trade. Uh, that's my job day to day, and I work within the mental health arena uh, with children and adults on a daily basis. So I was asked here to talk to you today. I've um, recorded some podcasts, which a couple are live on YouTube right now, and I think there's one more to go on around mental health and well-being for caregivers and uh, recommendations, advice, things like that to do. So it's not research-based, it's not what you've uh, been listening to for the last day and a half, so um, I'm just going to talk to you about what that means in terms of mental health and uh, being a caregiver. Uh, so it isn't just my academic qualifications and practice that allow me to have a good understanding and knowledge of the importance of mental health, although I hope I do. I've got a doctorate in it, so I'm hoping so. Um, <laughs> um, but it's also my family life as a parent in general, um, and a parent in general, and as a special needs, additional needs parent, Tango 2 parent. So we, lots of us sitting in this room know what that means in terms of the toll it can take on our well-being and mental health. And we do need to look after ourselves as well. So the aim of the podcast were to give you some tips and ideas and probably reminders, because I think you probably all know it, but we might not put it into practice on how to look after ourselves. Um, the toll that caring for someone who has complex needs can be great. Um, and we do stand a much better chance of thriving as a special needs parent rather than simply surviving if we fill our own cups, that was good because Kasha talked about that yesterday, and protect our own well-being too. So doing this will help build our capacity to cope, protect us from emotional harm and build resilience, not only in the day-to-day -day demands, but also in the periods of extreme stress and the challenging times that we can all face. So I think lots of us as parents have been through um, trauma, not to put it too uh, lightly, really, trauma with a capital T sometimes, and sometimes it's ongoing and it's day to day. So what can we do to survive this? What can we do to thrive in these environments and recover from those situations which are particularly tricky? Um, so I'm just going to give you a kind of a quick synopsis of what, what we talked about in the podcasts um, so that hopefully you'll go and watch them and, and uh, get, so, get a bit more detail from them. So. Um, Here's a few little things. What it's useful to do is notice. Notice what's happening in our bodies. Notice what's going on for you. And the symptoms that are happening inside our bodies really are linked with our thoughts as well. So the things that are happening, how we process that, what happens in our body. Um, our thoughts and feelings can trigger physical responses and behaviours. So what I want you to do is just imagine for a moment, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is just bringing your mind to it and remembering the things you already know. Think about a time maybe when you felt anxious. That's easy for us all to do because it's a normal human emotion. Everybody has experienced anxiety at some point. Um, what was your body doing when you felt anxious? Was your heart doing something? Was your temperature going up? So we have physical feelings, we have thoughts, feelings, and we have behaviours when we're anxious, all of those things. Um, so did your heart rise? Did you feel hot? Did you begin to sweat? Did your mind go blank? Did your stomach churn? Did your thoughts speed up or slow down? Did you pace around or jiggle about, you know, movement? Um, all of these things are behaviours associated with that feeling of anxiety. So if you can catch yourself doing certain things, you might be able to catch yourself thinking certain things and then have some control over it. That's just a really basic example. Here's some other things that can be helpful for your well-being. So getting outside fresh air, maybe not in the really hot, humid uh, Florida heat sometimes. Uh, it depends what you like. <laughs> um, or if you're in England, you know, put your raincoat on because it always rains um, and it's cold. Uh, so being outside, just fresh air, nature, noticing things, taking things in, being grateful for the surroundings that you're in, giving, and that, and that actually gives you just a little bit of time to yourself by being outside. So 
do you like to walk? Do you like to run? I, some people do. I, I don't understand it myself, but some people <laughs> like to run. I like to walk. Um, some people like to swim. Some people like to go and take photographs. Some people like to walk with a friend and have a conversation, have a chat. Um, building connection and community. So I'm talking to the already mindful of that because you're here today. Um, but building that community, finding things in common with people. Um, so if you're a caregiver, but, you know, hang out with other caregivers, talk to them about what that's like, talk to them how you feel, talk to about, you know, because there's no, there's no judgment there because everybody's in the same boat and it makes you feel more normal. It makes your life feel more typical, um, particularly if it's not every day for you. You know, your circle of friends aren't the same as you. So it's important to connect and communicate. Be part of a community. Talk to people. Don't bottle it up. So in the world of mental health, we often talk about helpful and unhelpful coping strategies. So sometimes unhelpful coping strategies make your stress work. Worse. Work? Worse. So uh, not talking makes your stress worse. Um, and I'm, all, I'm sure you can all think of an unhelpful coping strategy that you might have. But talking is a really helpful strategy. Walking, getting outside, also helpful. Um, so knowing, knowing what's good for you and what isn't. Um, having hobbies and interests, carving out time for yourself that's really away from the caregiving role. Um, so if you think that your hobby is going to Special Olympics with your child, well, it might be because you get to connect, but that's not for you entirely. So have you got something that is just yours, just for you? Um, I like to power lift. I like to lift really heavy things and put them down again, and then I feel better. Uh, so that's what I do. Um, that, my husband rides his bike. That's what he he goes out on bike rides for a long time, and and, and he feels better. You know, that's that's it. And and partly that's com community as well. So those things don't have to be lonely. They don't have to be on your own. They can be with another individual. So that's or, or a group of people, and they're all things that are just for you. Have you got something just for you that doesn't involve? Um, your caregiving role. Okay, taking care of your own physical health, and I think often we neglect that as a carer. We kind of say, oh, you know, that, that leg that's hanging off, it doesn't, I'll, I'll go next week, that's fine. Um, so take care, because if you aren't well, you can't be as good in your role as a caregiver, and that's really important to look after yourself and your own health and well-being. Um, and then an, a whole entire podcast episode that we talked about was journaling. Um, and so some people already do that. Some people are really good at that. And for some people, that feels like uh, that's not for me. That's it is for everybody. I believe me. It's really, really good stuff. So if you were to watch the podcast, it's just about finding things you're grateful for, making intentions for yourself, having some reflective time. Um, and I, I always go with the phrase of being a reflective person rather than a reactive person. So if you can reflect on a situation and be preactive rather than reactive then you're, you stand a much better stead of, of managing it well and being able to cope with it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to go through with you one of my favourite all-time well-being activities now. You've all got a piece of chocolate in front of you, hopefully. Um, <laughs> I'm really hoping you, you haven't eaten it yet. So... <laughs> um, I, I will give you this little confession. We managed to leave Seb's suitcase at home in the UK. So, and in it was the my, uh, UK chocolate. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't think the American chocolate is up to standard. I don't think it's as, <laughs> it's not as good as the UK chocolate. Um, so, sorry, I, I was going to bring some UK chocolate, but I didn't. But I found the next best thing, which is lint chocolate. So please refrain right now. Just look at your chocolate. Don't eat it. If you've eaten it, put your hand up. Dan will give you another bit. Um, <laughs> we are going to do chocolate mindfulness. So I really want you to just focus, forget everything else that's going on for you right now. You can remember all the science and the talks again afterwards. But um, what I'd like you to do is just focus on this chocolate. And I'm going to take you through a chocolate mindfulness activity. If you've unwrapped it already, stop it. You haven't, you're not allowed to do it. I can see you. Okay, so, um, right, follow the instructions. Just focus on your chocolate, nothing else. And even in a time when life might be really difficult, remember this fun activity and think, can I pick up a piece of chocolate and do this again and just have two minutes to myself and really focus on this lovely... I'm really sorry if you don't like chocolate or you've got a dairy allergy. You'll just have to, you know, imagine. OK, so... <laughs> pick up your wrapped chocolate in your hand, but don't unwrap it. 
Don't unwrap it. <laughs> no. Hold on to it. Just, just have it in your hand. So place it in the palm of your hand. <laughs> and right now, what I'd like you to do is look at it. Okay, notice the colours and the shapes on the package. Feel the weight in your hand. Pretend like you've never seen a wrapped chocolate bar and examine it closely. Have a really good look. Touch the package with your fingers and feel its texture. What does it feel like? Pay attention to any sound that the wrapper might make. Examine the wrapper. Notice all of the colours. Notice the print that's on there. What does it look like? If you've ever chowed back a bag of lint chocolate before, you might not have noticed this. Um, look at the different sides of the chocolate wrapper and notice any place that the light reflects off the package. Are there any shadows? What does it look like? If your mind has begun to wonder and think about other things, that's okay. Just notice the thoughts and bring your attention back to the chocolate. Now begin to slowly open the wrapper. Listen for the sounds of the wrapper tearing and opening. Notice the movement of your hand, your fingers, the arm muscles as you open your chocolate. You may hear other people, you have heard other people opening their chocolate too. Notice the sounds and bring your atten attention back to your chocolate. Raise the chocolate to your nose and give it a smell. Slowly breathe in several times and focus on the different smells you can get. Does smelling the chocolate trigger anything else in your body? Can you notice anything else happening in your body as you smell the chocolate? Is your mouth watering? <laughs> Have you got any other thoughts like, hurry up and let me eat this chocolate? <laughs> What's taking so long? Um, if so, notice them and bring your atten attention back to just the smell of the chocolate. Now slowly take a small bite of the chocolate. Or half, it's only a small piece, isn't it? Don't chew it or swallow it, just put it in your mouth. And if you've chewed and swallowed, put another bit in. Uh, notice the taste and the feeling of the chocolate in your mouth. How does it feel as it starts to melt? Notice, that's a good noise, notice the sensation of the chocolate on your tongue. How is that feeling for you? How long does it take to melt? Move the chocolate around your mouth and try to notice the moment where you feel like you want to swallow. Slowly swallow the chocolate, focusing on all the sensations that are happening in your body right now. Notice, have you got any lingering tastes or sensation in your mouth? And I'm willing to bet for 100% of you, this was different to eating chocolate in a normal way. So how is it different? How has it felt? What did you notice about your body, about your sensations, about your mind during this exercise? And have you got any thoughts about how you can apply these principles to eating or doing activities in other areas of your life? And remember, you can take this activity with you if in a moment of high stress you think, I'm just going to mindfully eat a piece of chocolate. You just give yourself one minute from beginning to end, noticing every single sensation and just keep bringing your thoughts back. Now, mindfulness is one of the things that has been shown to change brain function and brain neural pathways. And I'm not going to go into the science of that now because I don't know it all. But um, if you can practice mindfulness, it's really, really good for the well-being. And there's so many free courses and free applications and things out there that are just really, really good for you. And it's very good mentally. And so you might think mindfulness meditation, not for me. Actually, it probably is for you especially if you're thinking that. So have a go. Have a go at engaging in those things. There's so many free things that you can do with it. And that brings us to the end of kind of a little bit of an overview of wellness and well-being for caregivers. So just remember the things you already know and, and do more of it. Do more of it, but have a go. Um, okay, so our next panellist is Vanny Lay, who is the Entertainment Outreach Programme Manager at Respectability. In this role, she ensures authentic disability representation in over 150 projects, including collaborations with Walt Disney Animation Studios titled Wish. With a focus on children's content, she promotes representation and awareness. Please welcome Vanny Lay.
Hello. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Tango2 Research Foundation, for having me. Um, my name is Vanny Lay. Um, I am the Senior Manager of Entertainment Partnerships at Respectability. Um, since I sent in that bio, I did get promoted, so new role. Um, but I work at Respectability. We are a nonprofit organization advocating for fighting stigmas and advancing opportunities for people with disabilities in all aspects of community. So while I work specifically within entertainment and media, I have colleagues who also advocate on the policy side within faith inclusion spaces um, and also community and civic engagement as well. Great, so the way we do that is through three missions, changing attitudes, advancing opportunities, and developing leaders. Um, today, I will specifically be talking about everyday inclusive disability language that you can use. The way we talk about disability is so incredibly important for fighting that stigma um, and ultimately empowering people to see people with disabilities for what they can do and not necessarily what they can't. Um, in addition to that, on-screen portrayals of disability are also incredibly important because when you see that representation on screen, um, again, also what you see impacts how you feel or act. And so that is supposed to say billion, not million. So 1.3 billion people in the world have a disability. So that means that one in six people have a disability. So different types are physical, sensory, cognitive, mental health, or other. Of course, Tango 2 rare disease also encompasses a lot of those different types of disabilities as well. Um, specifically within the United States, it's actually one in five people and then also one in four adults as well. And so disabilities can be temporary or permanent. They can be visible or non-apparent. And you can have a disability from birth or acquire it later in life. Um, and so you, for example, with Tango 2, can have one, that one disability from birth. But then as you get older or age, um, different manifestations and symptoms. So that is an example of how you can acquire additional disabilities as a result of that. And so when talking about disability, again, as allies, caregivers, and loved ones of those with Tango 2 disease, the way you talk about disability is really important because it affects the way that you, they, and others will see them. Um, in the grand scheme of the world, disability really doesn't have that much societal knowledge as an identity relative to other identities. Um, and so on top of that, when talking about an incredibly rare disease, um, talking about it in a very empowering way is so important. So some, ex I'll walk through a few of these examples. So something small that you can do in every day is to focus on using positive, neutral, and respectful language um, and straying away from passive victim words. So for example, something small that you can do instead of saying he suffers from Tango 2 disease, if the whole point is just to identify someone as having it, just say, he has Tango 2 disease. Um, another thing you can say, um, we oftentimes hear confined to a wheelchair or wheelchair bound. Um, people with wheelchairs, that's a part of an extension of their body. It allows them to access the world. Um, so, and that's just something they use. So saying the term wheelchair user can be incredibly powering um, rather than focusing on um, confinement or bound, which has that negative connotation attached to it. In addition, also using empowering and accurate language that highlights what they can do rather than what they can't. Um, I, we often hear words like impaired or challenged. So for example, hearing challenge. Um, instead, using language such as just hard of hearing or deaf. Um, in addition, instead of using the terms visually impaired, um, perhaps blind or low vision. And then something that often is used um, is able-bodied or normal as synonymous with non-disabled. Um, that implies that disabled bodies aren't able or aren't necessarily normal when, as we saw in the statistic, one in six people in the world have a disability. So we, people with disabilities are actually considered the largest minority group in the world. Um, and so there's visibility out there. and therefore is normal. It just might look a little different than what someone might be used to. And then something that I myself am actively trying to do is eliminate common 
ableist language from our everyday vocabulary. So some words that you may often hear or use yourself, um, as do I, are crazy, tone deaf, insane, blindly. So maybe instead of calling something crazy, just saying, oh, that's silly or that's ridiculous. Um, instead of saying tone deaf or blindly, saying, oh, that's um, you're unaware or ignorant. Um, and those are words that are not only more respectful and accurate to what you're trying to describe, but also are more inclusive and not leaning into those ableist language. Um, thing, words like deaf, um, deaf mute, um, mute and deaf and dumb can be seen as offensive. Um, using terms like nonverbal and non-speaking are more appropriate and considered inclusive language and again goes a long way to finding that stigma. And then in addition to just everyday inclusive language, disability in Hollywood and representation is incredibly important. So um, if you don't have one at your seat already, there's content recommendations as well. Um, and so some things that you can see, and if you don't have it, I have extra copies, so please come find me. Um, but disability in Hollywood and representation is so incredibly important because when you see that on-screen representation, it impacts how you feel and how you act. So the image here is the cast of characters from Disney's newest film, Wish. I'm a little biased, but I would highly recommend watching it. Um, you may notice that there is an Asian woman in that image. Um, her name is Dahlia. She also uses a crutch. Um, Semi-spoiler alert, but throughout the film, it's never mentioned um, or, or like no one ever talks about it or anything like that. She just happens to be the best friend of the main character. She also is the best baker in town and is the king's personal baker. Um, and then also just happens to use a leg crutch at the same time. And she's just naturally integrated into the cast. Um, and those are the kinds of representations that we want to see when people with disabilities are just integrated into society. Other ways that you can do that is showing a student or a receptionist or a barista um, with a developmental disability, for example, and seeing that on screen dramatically influences the way that people um, see people with disabilities in real life. And then when you have content that includes disability, not only do disabled people tune in, but family, friends, loved ones, and other people with disabilities also see it. So according to Nielsen, the disability market is actually a trillion dollar market. And so when businesses are leaving out disability or disability as part of their initiatives, it's actually not the economically smart thing to do because you're leaving out a trillion dollar market. And then within children's content and children's TV, unfortunately, we have a lot of work to do, which is why I'm in the profession I am. I love that I get paid to just watch movies and TV shows. But within children's TV, um, less than 1% of leading characters have a disability, and that is awful because that means that that shows that people with disabilities aren't deserving of being leading characters when that's not necessarily the case. You're in the main character of your own life and your own story, and we deserve to have that representation on screen as well. And then in family film specifically, a historic high of a whopping 8% of family films have a lead character with a disability. So we're advocating and striving for more and better. But within that representation, we do see positive depictions of people with disabilities in the workplace. So they're more likely to be seen as hardworking in management, in STEM careers, and also as leaders. And then in addition to those content recommendations that are in the document, I wanted to highlight one specific example um, that's kind of universally relatable if you haven't seen this film. Um, and maybe it's one that you didn't realize was disability representation, but Finding Dory is actually a fantastic example of a film that has disability inclusive content because there are multiple characters with disabilities, including the lead character herself, Dory. So Dory has short-term memory loss, if you recall, but then there are other characters such as Nemo that has physical disabilities. One fin is smaller than the other, um, and it's a major plot point also in Finding Nemo as well with Gil in the first film. 
and then Hank, who is missing a tentacle, Destiny, who has low vision, and then Bailey, who has difficulty with echolocation. So yes, you can portray human disabilities in animal characters as well, and that really resonates. Um, the beautiful thing about Finding Dory is that in throughout the film, disability isn't necessarily something that Dory has to overcome, but something that she just learns to live with and do things in her own Dory way. You might recall the iconic line, just keep swimming, um, and that's exactly what Dory does. All right, and that brings me to the end of my presentation. Again, there are other content recommendations in that document. Um, had I made the handout later, I would have added Inside Out 2 to that because I just saw that uh, yesterday. So would highly recommend great representation of anxiety. Um, but with that, that is all I have for you. So thank you so much for having me. With that, I will pass it on to the next panelist, which is Rhonda Thorington. So Rhonda Thorington is a licensed professional counselor with a career spanning over 20 years, and she is devoted to providing mental health treatment to families and individuals of all ages. Um, in 2012, her life took a turn when one of her three children was diagnosed with mixed connective tissue disease at the age of four, so she now uses her clinical expertise to coach families facing life-challenging medical diagnoses by sharing valuable tools and strategies developed throughout her journey. So with that, please welcome Rhonda Thorington. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm moving a little slow, wearing a boot, so bear with me. Uh, so, oh, here's the clicker. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I wanted to, um, I was excited when I was asked to come here because I really, uh, my passion is helping parents and caregivers who have children with a rare disease because I feel like, you know, uh, caregivers and parents don't um, get the support that you need. So I'm so excited to be here. And I want to talk about just navigating the psychological impacts of serious illness just for a few minutes and some support strategies for families. Oh, my slide looks a little wonky. So um, the, when we look at families that are impacted by rare disease, it impacts us across all realms. It impacts families physically, you know, when you are uh, managing the um, uh, physical uh, illness of your child. It impacts families financially. You know, when we have a child with a rare disease, you know, how many of us have had to leave our careers, have had to scale back our careers in order to manage our child's condition. In our case, uh, when my daughter got sick, I was four years into establishing a private psychotherapy practice. I was an adjunct professor at a local university, and overnight, everything changed. You know, I had to scale things back exponentially. I went from uh, working uh, nonstop to hardly working at all, and that impacted our family financially. Uh, spiritually, you know, regardless of what your spiritual beliefs are, in, in no world does it ever make sense for a child to be stricken with a life-changing illness. And undoubtedly, we are always left wondering why. You know, why did this happen? You know, why is this okay? This is not fair. So, and lastly, the psychological ramifications, too. So when we look at the psychological impacts of serious illness, what we know to be true, what the research shows us, is that um, upwards of 70% of caregivers um, have increased rates of anxiety, depression, and stress when it comes to uh, caregiving of a child with a rare or chronic illness. Uh, caregivers have increased rates of anxiety, uh, increased rates of depression, uh, increased rates of chronic stress, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. This is something that we are often, we often don't discuss. You know, there's the whole, uh, the, you know, 
uh, uh, relatively uh, recent research has shown there's this whole phenomenon of medical PTSD where parents and caregivers and patients are actually traumatized by the very medical treatments uh, that are designed to help. You know, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of um, symptoms, as a result of medical gaslighting. You know, how many of us have experienced uh, medical providers that don't take our concerns seriously? You know, I will um, say to you, I know none of the providers in this room uh, do that, uh, but um, I will tell you even now, 12 years into the journey, uh, I always second guess myself before I call my medical provider to discuss concerns about my daughter because I wonder, okay, is this, does this really rise to the level of acuity where I need to involve them? Are they gonna be dismissive of my concerns? So that really sticks with you. Um, I'll also share with you in terms of uh, like the PTSD piece. Um, so last summer, uh, our daughter was uh, placed on a medication that had some um, neuropsychiatric side effects and she, as a result, developed a medication-induced mood disorder. And that resulted in some really scary things, some scary thoughts, some scary behaviors. And you know, thankfully, uh, she got through it, we got through it as a family, but that was traumatic. It was traumatic for me as her mom, it was traumatic for her, for her siblings, for her dad. And so fast forward a year later, you know, because the, the, um, the worst of the symptoms occurred when we were on vacation last summer. So fast forward to this summer, we're at the happiest place on earth, and I find myself going back to last summer when she had such difficulty, such dark thoughts, and we had to make some um, very, um, uh, we had to have discussions and make decisions that we never thought we would have to have for one of our children. So even now, the trauma of that, the triggers to the memories, I have to uh, even remind myself now that this is a year later, we are not back there. So even now, the post-traumatic stress is still very real. Uh, the other, another psychological impact of serious illness is grief. You know, we often talk about uh, grief as it relates to loss of life, but there is also the notion of, you know, grief as it relates to loss of career. You know, grief as it relates to loss of um, re financial resources. You know, grief as it relates to, you know, loss of the child and that you thought you were going to have. Grief as it relates to uh, not being the parent that you thought you were going to be when you, you know, gave birth to this child. So grief can take many forms. And I was speaking to a family earlier who um, shared that, you know, when they were looking for grief support, they were turned away because every clinician they spoke to said, well, you can't have grief support because your child is still alive. So, and that's something that we have to change as providers. So when we talk about additional support, you know, oftentimes we don't realize what, you know, when we would need additional supports. So, you know, uh, when I speak to parents, uh, around that, one of the things that, you know, here's a list of things that you want to be, uh, uh, are kind of red flags uh, that will be an indicator that you might need additional support. If you have difficulty functioning, if you have difficulty managing your day to day, uh, when I'm working with kids, I always say, if you're having difficulty living your best kid life, then, you know, your kiddo might need some support. If you have extreme emotional reactions, you know, again, I'm a child therapist, so a lot of my analogies are kid focused. So if you have your anger thermometer or your sadness thermometer and something that should be like a five on your uh, anger thermometer or sadness thermometer is really is shows up as a 10, then you might need some additional supports. You might need additional support if there's a communication breakdown between family members. If family members, if y'all aren't talking to one another, you know, if you're no longer, um, uh, if you're no longer connected, then that's a sign that you might need additional supports. If you withdraw from life, 
if you had a robust uh, support group, a robust friend circle, and now you just don't communicate with anyone about anything, then that might be a sign that you need additional support. You know, I will share early on in my daughter's journey, I withdrew from everyone. You know, friends would contact me, they would text me, they would, you know, want to set up visits, and I wasn't, I wasn't returning texts, I would not uh, spend time with anyone, and that was a sign that I needed additional support. You have feelings of helplessness or hopelessness. You know, if you don't, if you no longer see any hope or happiness, then that might be a sign that you need additional support. In terms of children, if you notice changes in your child's behavior at home or at school, if your child is withdrawing, if your child has, you know, behavioral um, exacerbations, you know, and, and I think oftentimes we, we want to think about, you know, siblings, you know, of our children that have the rare disease. So what is their experience? You know, are they having, you know, um, increased behaviors at school? Are they withdrawing at school? And one of those, just a caveat about that, is oftentimes schools will not recognize that. You know, they'll recognize the kid that's throwing the chair across the room or cussing out the teacher, but they won't necessarily recognize the child that's sitting in the corner by themselves. So externalizing behaviors, absolutely. Internalizing behaviors, they're not so great at. Uh, you begin using unhealthy ways to manage stress. You know, are we, you know, medicating our feelings with food or sex or substances or alcohol? You know, that might be a sign. That's definitely a sign that you need additional supports. And what do those supports look like? You know, those supports can be, you know, finding a therapist. Those supports can be finding a support group. You know, that's another, I'm just so amazed and happy at this group here because there are so many people who are at different stages of this journey and it's beautiful to see how families are supporting one another. So you can be at the very beginning of your journey and you can see a family who is, you know, months or years down the road and you can see a path you can see that, okay, maybe one day I will get here. So maybe that's the support that you need. So if you have, uh, if you think you might need um, psychotherapy support specifically, there are some resources that you can go to in order to find uh, some of that uh, support. And that is if you're in the States. I wasn't really thinking if you were like out of the country, but I'm thinking about if you're in the States. One is a website, psychologytoday.com. Uh, and what I like about that website is you can go in and filter uh, resource, the, you can do specific filters for that. And one of the filters you can utilize is uh, chronic pain, chronic illness, uh, and you can look for a provider in your area. Uh, Give an Hour is also another organization. Oh man, five minutes already, daggone it. Okay, so Give an Hour is also another organization. Give an Hour is amazing because they use um, volunteer therapists. Therapists literally give an hour of their time to help support uh, people in, in across different areas. And one of the areas that they are um, uh, expanding into is the rare disease community. So, and they're um, putting a lot of resources into training therapists on how to work with families in the rare disease community. Um, another um, organization is globalgenes.org. They have a rare concierge um, network where you contact them, you let them know what your needs are, and they will connect you with a clinician who is um, knowledgeable in rare disease. Also looking at different rare disease organizations, I know that uh, Tango 2 has a network of clinicians that they refer to, uh, which is also helpful, and also asking around. If you have people within your network who have a, you know, a clinician, a support person, a consultant that they work with who is helpful, you know, find out who that is and you reach out to that person as well. Word of mouth is so powerful. And for me as a clinician, those word of mouth referrals are always the best ones. So when you're looking at finding the right therapist, um, what we, 
it's tough in rare disease for sure. Uh, so I came up with this graphic. It's a little busy, but I think it, it hits the point. The first thing you want to ask any clinician, like say you have a potential clinician you found on psychology today, you contact them and you want to ask, do you have experience treating rare disease? You know, do you have experience treating, you know, Tango 2? You know, if the answer is yes, then they might be a good fit. If the answer is no, then you want to ask this person, do you have experience treating chronic illness? If the answer is yes, could also be a good fit. If the answer is no, then you want to ask, okay, do you have experience treating, in this graphic I have, do you have experience treating chronic pain? Because that's the thing that kind of resonates uh, most with our situation and with my daughter. But whatever is the thing that resonates with you, do you have experience treating metabolic crisis? Do you have experience treating siblings of a child with a rare disease? You know, so whatever that piece is that resonates with you, ask. So, and when you're reaching out to a clinician, everyone, well, I won't say everyone, um, clinicians should be willing to offer a, uh, a consultation with you. So, and typically those consultations are about 15 minutes, and typically they're complimentary because you gotta figure out if it's a right fit. If a clinician won't do that, then that might not be the right clinician for you and your family. So once you've found someone that might be a good fit, then again, you wanna ask for a consultation and then you wanna look at some important questions. You know, what's your training? How long have you worked in this field? What populations do you work with? Because the therapeutic relationship is a relationship. So it's a two-way street. So you get to decide, is this person someone who is going to be a good fit for me? Um, tell me about what kinds of therapy and treatment you practice. What can I expect during treatment? How soon should I start feeling better? Because nobody wants to be in therapy forever. So how soon should I uh, expect to start feeling better? And how will you assess my progress? Um, what should I do if I don't feel better? And the last one, how much will treatment cost? Do you take my insurance? Are you in network? Are you, you know, do you have a sliding scale? All right, we're gonna move forward because I got one minute. Okay, <laughs> building support within the family. You know, it's important within the family, make sure, be clear about asking for what you need. Be real specific about that. If you need someone to come over so that, to sit with your child so that you can take a shower, be specific. Ask for those things, um, because my mama has a saying, a closed mouth don't get fed. So ask for what you need. Make room for siblings, too. You know, it's important to make sure you are, and I know everyone in here is spending time with the siblings, but you want to label it. Because unless you label it, they don't, it gets lost. So, like I guarantee, my kids are at the parks today, we're gonna be at the parks all week, unless I say, wow, wasn't that a wonderful vacation we had at Disney and we spent so much quality time together, then in three weeks they're gonna be like, y'all never spend time with us. So, <laughs> so, you have to label it, okay? And lastly, don't neglect your other relationships. So, you know, so many uh, marriages and partnerships end because of trauma you know, as a result of trauma, not being able to navigate past it. And so just it, the way to think about it, the way me and my husband think about it is that we're on the same team. There is no one in this world who knows more intimately what it's like to experience what we have gone through with our daughter than him. So, you know, looking at your partner as your partner and being on the same team is vitally important. So, and you need support. You know, we can't do this alone. So don't, um, uh, uh, don't hurt yourself by not allowing yourself to lean on your supports. So thank you very much. That's it. <laughs>